we're not going to follow that 100%. One of the things you got to realize is, is guidelines are guidelines. They're not, they're not uh, requirements. Not to, Governor Ashcroft has mentioned many times that he doesn't have any authority to demand a church anything because of the constitution of church and state. He, he has never, ever, he, Hutchison, I'm sorry. Who did I say? Oh. <laughs> anyway, so uh, he has, you know, but he has stated more than once that, you know, that there is, there in the Constitution declares separation for church and state, and therefore he doesn't have the authority. He's mentioned that to require anything of a church. Um, but... Uh, but that he does give guidelines or recommendations, and he appreciates those that follow them. One of the things you got to remember is when he puts out a guideline, he is he's putting out something that fits. You know, in other words, he can't explain every situation uh, and and make uh, exceptions for different situations. He just has to put out a blanket guideline. Um, I think we're as safe, just about as safe as we can get. I am requesting some things that, n number one, I, I did tell Sister Hannah this week that we will stop Children Church. We won't have any Bible studies outside of this room until this thing slows down some. Uh, and then I, I don't want anyone sitting at tables that is not sitting with people that they normally sit with. Uh, you know, I'm not against the girls, or the kids sitting at a table themselves if there are if it's with people that they're around all the time. But I'm just trying to say, don't sit with somebody you hadn't been around all the time. And uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, of course we can't spay, we can't wear a mask in the dining room while we're eating. I mean, I tried to drink, get a cup of drink of coffee a few minutes ago with my mask on. It didn't work very good. And so. Uh, so, and then upstairs, you know, um, I, I don't think anyone ought to be walking around, moving around in the church, going to the bathroom, whatever, without their mask. I think all of our ushers should be wearing masks at all times. Um, our singers on the platform, they, they are spacing, and I'm not requiring them to wear a mask. They all have their own microphone. They are not mixing microphones to, to one another. And they clean the microphone at the piano if a different one uh, goes up there with a, with a uh, bacterial, antibacterial wipe. And uh, so we're being very careful. Then, then in the dining room, no one is going in the kitchen. No one is touching any food or anything but those that are working in the dining room and they have on gloves and they're the only ones that are handling anything. So, up and then upstairs in the pews, I don't think you ought to be sitting with anyone that you're not regular normally with, which is mostly family. So, for everybody, just one people that you're with, basically your family per pew, and at least a pew between. And it, it's okay if you spit two two pews. Uh, and our church is big enough upstairs to space. Uh, more than space as much as needed. Those of you that want to wear a mask all the time while you're in service, you're welcome to do so, but I'm not going to require that if you space properly and wear a mask anytime you get up and move around in the church. I am ordering, uh, I'm ordering um, <clears throat> some air purifiers that kills 99.9% .9 of all viruses. Uh, we're going to have six of them in the church. It's going to be a little bit expensive, but I think it's well worth it. It keeps the air from being stale, and uh, we'll have four, two in the back part of the sanctuary, two in the front part of the sanctuary, and two on the platform. So we're going to get that done, and I think that I'm, I, I've been wanting to do that even before we had coronavirus. So uh, I you know, you come in a church that's been here for, you know, all week long, and remind me to mention Wednesday nights. That, uh, but you come in here all week long, 
there's nobody been in here. It, it, the air is stale. The air conditioner is not working very much at all, or the air, air blower because of, of nothing going on. And uh, and that's why people come to church and they get sleepy because the air is stale. But it, with these air purifiers, we we don't have to turn them on. I mean, we can turn them on Saturday night and turn them off Sunday when we leave, and it will charge the air and, and purify the air. And uh, so, yes. Uh, no, I, I don't guess I even probably know about it, but I know that these air purifiers pur cleanse 99.9% .9 of everything. That's why I was thinking, uh, I've got two of them in my home. And I've certainly noticed a difference since we've had them, you know. But I'm open to hear about anything uh, that I'm not, you know, not aware of. If it's if it works better or it's cheaper, then I'm, I'm more than willing to consider it for sure. Um, uh, Wednesday nights. I'm going to I want to tell you why I've never added back Wednesday nights. And. Uh, I've wanted to, and I've started to several times. I'm, I think me and Sister Crow would have welcomed it. <laughs> Don't you love Sister Crow? You know, she, she loves church. I, I love that about her. And, but the reason I have it is because they say that most people that come into contact with coronavirus has symptoms within two to five days, most people. But they can have them as much as 8, 14 days. That's why, by the way, Jacob and Terry and the kids aren't here right now because uh, Wednesday will be their 14th day after they came in contact. They are doing fine, though, no symptoms. So we're thankful for that. But I did ask them not to come back for 14 days. I just think that we need to be careful. Um, but in, in fact, because that they're saying most people have symptoms within two to five days after contact. I'm thinking our people are moving around all week. They're around people they're not normally around. And if, if they come in contact with something during the week and we wait till the following Sunday, there's seven days there that possibly if people were in contact any time during that week, they would come down with symptoms before Sunday. Therefore, I've held off of having Wednesday services for that reason, and especially now with this influx. I've, two or three times I've been going to add it back. Every time I start to add it back, it, there's an influx. So I, I think, well, maybe we better wait a while. So anyway, I don't know if I don't know how many of you. Are, I know some of you. Uh, do can I tell if you get on? my broadcast on Thursday night, even if you don't put nothing on. If you just click on, can I tell it? I see, I see that. If, if a person lets me know they're there, I see that. But I figure there's a lot of people who gets on there don't say nothing, and I don't know they got on there. Is that right or not? Yeah. Yeah. We normally have several people watching but I never know you know some of you I think where are you at where are you what are you doing playing hooky on this you know <laughs> what brother Mark, boy some watch it afterwards yeah a lot of people are doing that I know that and it's true that you can watch it on TV or you can watch it uh, you can watch it on a on a on a tablet or a computer, you know, and everybody can sit around and watch it. So I know that that's happening. But uh, and then there's people that has things going on that maybe they can't watch it, but then they watch it later. You know, I didn't know that Thursday night was so good, but Brother McGowan told me it was, and that he watched it twice. So if one of you didn't see it, well, he watched it for you. Um, uh, I might mention uh, 
too, we, we've had a, a, a problem with our water here in the church. We've had, <clears throat> we got hit with a $1,700 water bill last month, and we'll have one probably that big this month. We've, we've done everything you can imagine. We went through the whole church. Brother Durham and Brother Matthew are to be thankful for <clears throat> helping us with it. We've had the construction crew from the city out. We've had technicians out. Brother Durham finally found that we had a small leak. Uh, we had a small leak in the gym that was from this the supply line that came into the gym that went to the bathrooms. The leak evidently was under the slab. And so we had to cap that off. So there is no, there's no water in the drinking fountain or the bathrooms in the gym. Uh, we did have a small leak in the restroom, in the ladies' restroom in the center uh, commode. I turned it off, but somebody turned it back on. And, you know, I guess I don't know what they were thinking, but my bad. I should have put a sign on the door and on the top of the commode lid and said, out of order, <laughs> you know, maybe in giant red letters. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know if we got that fixed. Uh, it's partially fixed, but Matthew and I, we spent a lot of time over here yesterday, and we still, it may be a new problem. There's a microphone right there. <laughs> Um, we went through, well, long story short, I think a new leak has developed from pressuring down and pressuring up and pressuring down and pressuring up the water from the meter into the building, and I'm going to have to come back over here, and we used 222 gallons of water yesterday uh, with nothing running in here. Uh, oh, the only thing that was running was the ice maker. So I've got another idea. I'm going to try and isolate it again. It's possible with everything we've done, we may have created a leak um, out in the parking lot. I don't know yet. I'm going to try and isolate it, um, but temporarily until we get this fixed, we're going to shut the water off after church and we're got, not going to turn it back on unless. Matthew or I, or one of you need water, then we'd be happy to come over and do it. But being that we used 222 gallons in a 24-hour period from 9 o'clock yesterday morning until 9 o'clock this morning, that's 66,000 gallons of water. So that, that'll be another big bill. But we're trying to get our handle on it, but this plumbing's old. And we won't have any more services until it's fixed after this service, after today. So I'm not going to keep paying well, thousand fifteen hundred dollars of services. I'm, so I'm, I'm turning the water off, and so. But we're running from this morning till this afternoon. No. Which if if oh. I, if in 24 hours we run 66 what thousand gallons? No, no. What I said in in 24 hours we used 222 gallons of water in 24 hours, which is about what is that into 12? That, in well, that's 1100. Uh, 20 220 be 110. And then, you know, so we're probably going to use 80 or some odd gallons today. Which is, which is not a lot, you know. If that was nobody here, so it doesn't matter if you have a service or not. No, 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 no. we can shut it off. You aren't we listening can, to what I'm shutting saying. shutting the water off. I can shut the water off after the church and uh, at the meter, and there'll be no more running. But for the four hours that we're here, it's, it's not going to be that much. We're working on it. Uh, and we may use an extra 80 gallons of water a week, which is not that much water, you know. But we are working on it. To, to, and I've already contacted the city. And when we get, there was a pretty good leak over there. And Matthew and I, we got that capped off. And there's a little leak indicator. And it quit spinning as it was. It's not spinning as fast as what it was, but it's barely turning. But this is a big meter, so that barely turning uh, turns into 222 gallons of water. What is what is 222 divided by 24? Does well, anybody know? Well, it's almost up. How much? That it's it, it's you. It's losing 10 gallons 
extra of water an hour. So if we keep the water on for five hours, that's only 50 extra gallons, which is some, like these toilets here, they use five gallons of water each time they flush. That's flushing one of these toilets 10 times extra a week. So it's not a, not a whole lot, but I, it, it, it's up to you what you want to do with this. Well, service. I'm just it's, saying, it, it, but, but now let me, let, me, let me clarify a little bit about what he's saying. He has talked to the city and they have agreed to adjust our bill and 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 uh, where we won't have to pay any of this $1,700 if we get it fixed within a proper amount of time and uh, get back to them. So the city's working. Brother Durham, you know, he's in charge. He was been in charge of the plumbing department, Little Rock Schools, for many years, and they know him up there. So he's. He's got good rapport with them, and thank goodness for that. But it looks like we, we're probably going to probably going to uh, escape the bullet, you know. Here, yeah. so, but I'm just saying we we got to get this thing under control some way. We don't know, you know. We don't know exactly. You know, we thought we had it fixed because yeah. when he when when he had Matthew cap off the gym, it stopped. It stopped everything. Now it started back up again with nobody here. So we don't know now what's going on. I uh, really think it's outside, but I'm going to determine that early next week if it's outside or inside. Well, if it's outside, we got a problem because we got a we got a leak underneath the parking lot, which which would mean we we're going to have to you know dig up dig it dig a trench through the parking lot and have that fixed after we find a water line. So anyway, let's just all pray that the Lord will help us. Little update on that. Matthew and I, uh, we uh, looked at if we have to redo anything under the existing parking lot, uh, the worst we would have to do is trench about uh, 25 feet, about one foot wide across the asphalt to come into the church over by the stairway, okay, and then come up and go over. We can hook into right above the men's restroom down here. We can hook into that line that would feed. Uh, it's the supply line. Uh, right, the supply line which would refeed the church. And from there, we could go overhead through that insulated space. You remember when we insulated mm -hmm. underneath the, the restroom? We can go between that, and we would have about 10 feet of exposed water line, inch and a half water line, inch and a quarter water line, which I've done this before. If you insulate it light, right and you cover it with an aluminum shield, it won't freeze. So we've already got, uh, if, uh, if we have to, we've already got a plan in place that we can okay. do that. Good. All right, anyway, that's an update, you know, on the water uh, situation. But the main reason we're telling you, we know there's, you know, not anything. We're not asking y'all to do anything. We're just asking you to be aware that during the week when you come in here, there won't be any water. It's going to be shut off until we get this figured out. Yeah. So, um, and for maybe, maybe we ought to mention this in case some of the men get some bright idea about, <laughs> about anything. The water main valve will not shut off completely. So we have to shut it off at the backflow preventer. Back preventer valve, which is maybe 20 feet it's south of the, of the original. Five, 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 five feet? feet. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Well, Brother Durham's saying he feels like we, we're going to have control of it. Well, that's not going to have to happen. So right now we're, right now we're good. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let me give you this report. Brother Ron Johnson called me this morning, and I and I talked to him. He he he's home from the hospital as of yesterday. Uh, he had Brother Michael Smith told us last week he had uh, a septic shock because they removed his um, leads to they removed his pacemaker too, by the way, and the leads to his pacemaker, and that caused him to go into septic shock, and he almost died. But he's home. He's on a 24-hour IV drip right now, but he's doing good. He sounded good on the phone. And, and, but his wife, Sister Beth, is leaving this week to go back to Houston to have surgery for her cancer. And they just, it's, I'm telling you, they just don't, can't get over all this with her. 
and then this with him. So I told him we would certainly be keeping him in prayers, but I appreciate this update that they're doing, you know, he's doing much better. And they want us to pray for her. They're hoping and are hoping that that she will be cancer free after this last surgery that she's going to have. Anyway, um, all right, let's see if we can get do something that has to do with the Bible. <laughs> uh, you know, I was thinking this morning, I thought, how many of you people, do you all realize we're in the future, you know, when God begins to deal with Babylon and call his children out of Babylon, we're going to have an influx of people. And uh, um, and everybody in here is going to be busy. We got to win new people, our brothers and sisters from Babylon, that God calls them into the body of Christ. And you should be preparing yourself for that. In fact, you should be prepared now for uh, uh, for people that knew that may come in you know we're we're sort of in a position here in this church right now especially with coronavirus uh you know i think there's a lot of people not we don't even have all of our people faithfully able to come right now uh, our crowd's down a little bit because of coronavirus but but i do believe that i think god's going to deal especially with this united states to a point that uh, people are going to get hungry for God. People that are that that have had uh, a connection with God, but have lost that connection. I think those people God's going to begin to deal with. Uh, so, <clears throat> and I was just thinking in the last few days. I thought, if someone asks you, you know. Uh, What's your church all about? You know, what, what, what would you tell them that makes them understand that this church is different from other churches? You know, what, what would be, you know, if somebody asked you, I need to know about your church. I need to know... Uh, uh, I'd like to know what y'all believe. I want to. I'd like to know, you know, what kind of church you go to. Well, the first thing I think you should tell them is, is our church is different. Our church is different than most churches, and you need to understand why. And I think you are to be able to. The first thing you should be able to tell them is. Is. If you don't understand that what you read in the New Testament, which was the what we would call the early church, or the church in the end of the Jewish world, when Jesus came to this world, and then he uh, called out 12 apostles that were eyewitnesses to him, and that... Uh, received what he gave and and he was with them in the spirit through the baptism of the Holy Ghost he and his father until he finished harvesting that world and making up the bride I think you should use that term the bride that, that the bride you need to understand the difference in this church is understanding on the bride of Christ and what most Christendom is but that's not the most important thing to understand in the beginning. The most important thing to understand is, is, is that the church fell away that you read about in the New Testament. And you need to be able to give them scriptures as to, as to the fact that it did fall away. And then you need to be able to answer the question, why did it fall away? So... Uh, Yes? Is it? Are you having trouble hearing me? I can't hear you real good. The just fine. I could probably maybe turn it up just a little bit. Sorry to 
ground up. Oh, uh, huh? Yeah. So, we'll, I'll try to speak a little louder, Sister Crow. Uh, so, I think uh, you ought to be able to give scriptures as to, you know, having having a an, an exact uh, set of scriptures that you can give people to number one show them that the Bible's clear on the fact that the church did fall away. Okay, um, <clears throat> and I think I would I would start that with. Uh, with Second Second Thessalonians two, and this is this is uh, they won't believe what you're saying just because of this scripture. But when you tie it together with the scriptures I'm going to give you, they will. Um, <clears throat> and and y'all have heard these scriptures, but I don't know that I've ever put it to you that here's what you should use. You know, I'm going to give you like three or four scriptures that should be sufficient to help them to see that the church fell away. Um, in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, Paul is writing, uh, number one, uh, let's see, if I want somebody to give me the scripture in Acts, where, where they went to Thessalonica. I'm sure I can find it, but some of you brethren probably help me with it. Uh, where Paul went to Thessalonica and he got run out of town, he, and then he went to Berea. <laughs> it would. I'm sorry. Yeah, it would be after the 15th chapter where they went to. Uh, okay. Yeah, Acts 17. Let's start in the very beginning. Acts 17 says, Now when they had passed through Philopolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening the alleged and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a, a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows and the, of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they formed, found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither too. Uh, let's see, we're... What verse am I on? I can't find it. Six. And when they found them not, they drew Jason's certain brethren, okay, and rulers of this city crying, these have turned uh, the world upside down or come hither too also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying that there are also, there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers, and when they heard these things, and when they had 
take in security of Jason the other and let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas to, uh, by night unto Berea. Okay, I want you to read again the, the um, second verse. And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. That's three weeks. Paul was in Thessalonica three weeks. That's, that's how long he was there before he got run out of town. And then he writes these letters back. He sent Timothy back. If you, you know, read the first, first Timothy, I mean, first Thessalonians and second Thessalonians, he sent him back, but he wasn't there himself. And so when the reason I'm giving you that scripture is because the, the, the church in Thessalonica was a brand new church. It was just a little new church, baby church. And so there was a lot of things they didn't understand. They were still embracing. Okay, and then in the second, second Thessalonians, the second letter in the second chapter, now he's answering questions. He, and he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's, in other words, he's saying, look, I want you to understand this. Don't get shook. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus is coming anytime soon. Now, this was a little bit, in their day, I'm sure confusing to some people because to the Jews, Jesus was not only coming, he had already came on the day of Pentecost. He came to that church back there. But he wasn't coming to make up his bride among the Gentiles until the church fell away and there was a whole other world God was going to deal with. It would be the end of that world that he would do that. And yet at the same time, he was coming for the Jews. So that had to be understood by the by the Gentiles back there. Um, so he goes on and says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Um, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he is he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Then he says, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So he's telling that church that there's going to be a falling away. Now, one of the things you need to be able to explain to people is, is Paul is talking to a church called the Thessalonican, the, the church of the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago. He's not talking to you. He's not talking to me, nor the church down here. He's not telling us down here there's going to be a falling away. The way this is preached out there and the way all of them have ever heard it is that the church is going to fall away down here. That's what they teach. They teach that we're in the midst of a falling away because the church is in such a mess. That's how they teach that. But it's not true. He was telling them, there's going to be a falling away. Don't let anybody tell you Jesus is fixing to come for you Gentiles because the church is going to fall away and there's going to be a man of sin uh, uh, how did he say it? it opposeth himself, exalteth, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and worship, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. He's actually, it's a prophecy concerning the Pope. And <clears throat> uh, so, and he calls him the son of perdition. Um, I'll give you this right now uh, in Revelation 17, 8. And just tie this in if you want. Uh, verse 17, 8. 
It says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and goeth into perdition. And they that dwell, that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And that's just talking about the Pope that comes into existence. Then he goes out of existence, and then he will come back into existence in the end of the Gentile world. So this is dealing with the falling away, and again, this is probably not going to convince very many people, but that wording, there will be a falling away first, and the fact this was a letter written to a church 2,000 years ago for them to understand that their church was going to fall away. Okay, now, uh, now turn to Acts, the 20th chapter. Um, and Paul here is talking to the uh, elders uh, in, in Ephesus. Uh, seventeenth verse it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. He begins to talk to them. You can read this for yourself, but look what he says in uh, the twenty ninth verse. He said, For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you, warn every one, day and night, with, te with, fear, with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. So he's telling them, when I leave, there's going to be grievous wolves entering in, spoiling the flock, men of them own selves, that are going to rise up making disciples of them own selves. He's just showing the condition of the church, uh, what condition it's going to get in when, when their apostle leaves off of the scene. Then let's turn to John. St. John, I mean John, 1st John, the, the, the epistle of 1st John. And let's go to the 4th chapter. <clears throat> so I'm giving you 2nd Thessalonians 2. What is that scripture that says they'll fall away? Church will fall away? Well, I don't know what verse that is. Somebody know it? Y'all not taking notes? I don't remember exactly what. All right. I'll go. Three? Okay, verse three. Okay. Um, then I gave you uh, Acts. 20, verse 29. Okay, now, 1 John 4, chapter 4. Now, <clears throat> this, this is not Paul speaking anymore. This is the Apostle John. And here's what, and remember, John, by the way, by the time this epistle was written, it's, uh, it's pretty well known historically that all the other apostles were dead. He wrote the book of Revelations, and this was written uh, pretty close to the same time before it, a little bit before it. But um, here's what John is saying. He's saying, Beloved, believe not every spirit. By the way, let me give you all a little, uh, let, me, let me just give you a little advertisement here. <laughs> Some of you may realize I don't have my glasses on. So I've got on contacts, <clears throat> and I've got on some brand new kinds of contacts. It's only been out for this year. And these contacts 
are both bifocal and distance. I, the reason I never wore buff contacts, I mean, I've tried every kind of thing you can think, but never before could you wear a contact and be able to see if you needed bifocals, but you can now. It's amazing. And so I'm just giving you a little, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a little uh, station break here. <laughs> uh, these, here, whoever come out with this is a genius. These contacts, when you look at something uh, close up, your pupils dilate automatically. When you look at something near, like you're going to read. Then you look at something far away, your, your pupils uh, constrict. Uh, actually, you're looking through uh, the outer part of your pupils to see distance. You're looking through the center part of them to see close up. Whoever made these contacts, they're, they're made in little circles. The, the center circle is contacts. The, the circle outside of that is for not reading, but maybe from here to Sister Hannah. But then distance is your outer, the outer circle of these contacts. That I'm talking about the pupil part. And so it's amazing, but I, I can see, I can read and see distant and reading 2025 vision very clearly. I can actually read 2020 vision. I have to strain a little bit for it, but I don't have to strain to read my body. I mean, this is not, 20, I, you know, it's better than, 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 than 2020. So <clears throat> anyway, I can, I can, uh, it's a miracle. <laughs> Anyway, I just thought I'd just throw that in because uh, some of you are probably thinking, how's he doing this? Because before, any, any time I had contacts, I had to have reading glasses. Therefore, you might as well just have glasses if you, you got to have something to read. Anyway, beloved, believe not every spirit, 1 John 4, 1, and try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. What he's working on right there is the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God that come in the flesh. And he's showing that that's not of God. And it's an Antichrist spirit that existed back then. People talk about the Antichrist down here. Antichrist existed back there because they were anti-Christ. The Jews did not believe he was the Son of God or the Messiah. Um, the difference down here, and you won't be able to talk to people much about this when you first start dealing with people, but, but um, the difference down here is, is that when people don't believe this is the body of Christ, that's antichrist. That's an antichrist spirit. You'll have to get a revelation that this body is a work of the Son of God that is restoring his church and that he's going to make his bride up out of. And if people that reject that reject God. They reject God's purpose and his plan through Jesus Christ. All right, anyway, let me go on. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming, I'm reading the third verse again, flesh is not of God, and this is, is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So, <clears throat> um, so I, I think if you, re if you read this scripture here, they letting them know John sees that there's already a falling away of the church. There's false prophets went right out, you know, in the church. There, the church is, is in a falling away condition. Um, then uh, I think if you would go to Revelations 11, and I know many of those people out there ain't going to know one thing, one thing about Revelations, but it's very clear in the 11th chapter that here, God, the Lord, he, 
in, in verse 1, it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Here, John has showed that the, the church, the temple, that he's telling him to measure it. Why? Why would he need to measure it? Because there ain't going to be nothing left but the outer court in a little while. The temple there is talking about the holy place and the holy of holies. And so he tells him to measure it and and but you don't have to measure don't you don't measure the outer court. It's going to remain. That's the only thing that's going to remain, the outer court. But the Gentiles are going to tread it underfoot for forty two months. Now you won't be able to help them right away. You can tell them that you know, 30 days was in a, in a Jewish calendar and that uh, uh, that uh, 42 months would, e would equal 1,260 days. And I would just tell them, you know, I'm not, we're not going to go into this right now, but 1,260 days prophetically equals 1,260 years. There's a day for a year prophetically there. But the main thing they need to understand is is that the there wasn't nothing left but the outer court and the Gentiles trotted underfoot. They they didn't even know how to deal with the outer with the outer court. For twelve hundred and sixty years there wasn't anything uh, you know I, you can carry people further than this. I mean, if, even if you read this on down, you're going to read where there's the two witnesses, which if you read uh, Zechariah, the fourth chapter, those two witnesses, it'll tell you who those two witnesses are, the Word of God, the Old and New Testament. And they lay dead in the streets for three and a half days. <clears throat> uh, that's uh, that's three three and a half days equals three and a half years, which is forty two months. It's the same time frame, and <clears throat> so the word of God prophesied in sackcloth and ashes. He tells here in the fourteenth chapter of Revelations. I think if you'll study the scriptural settings that I'm giving you, you'll have a pretty good clear understanding that it's it's absolutely not hard to understand that the church fell away. And after three and a half days, if you look in the 11th verse, after three and a half days, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they that heard, and they that heard a great voice from heaven, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake. That is the restoration of the church when, you know, after three and a half days, the 1260 years, then they stood up on their feet. That's the Reformation. That, that lasted, you know, that, that took place for a long time of God getting these two witnesses, the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, to stand up on their feet, and finally God said, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's the restored church, that cloud is. That's not going, they didn't go to heaven right there, they just ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And uh, so, um, now, you can take them back to the sixth chapter of Revelations and just explain the horses to them. I, all of y'all know probably enough about these horses. You know, and it, it, the horses are in the first eight verses. And the white horse, it starts off with the white horse, 
the rider on the white horse was going forth conquering and to conquer. He had a bow in his hand. And that's Jesus. Jesus white uh, horses in the Bible represent uh, the church. And you can show that with Joel, the second chapter. Joel 2. This is, you know, I didn't, this ain't, I just, be honest with you, I didn't even know I was going to talk about this when I got here today, but this, I've talked about this stuff so much that I know where all this is without having to. Okay, in Joel 2, um, and verse 2, and 3 and 4. A day of darkness, a day of clouds. And you can also remember this. The book of Joel, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost on the, at the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and he said, this is that spoken of the prophet Joel. Joel's little three-chapter prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. This, that, that, that fulfilled those scriptures. So that's what this is talking about. A day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness, as the morning spread up on the mountain. That's talking about a, it's speaking of rain, come a big rain. A great people and strong, there's never, ever been the like. Neither shall be any more for it, after it, even to the years of many generations. Y'all know that's a favorite scripture of mine because that indicates there is another group after many, many generations, which is us. Then he says, a fire devours before them judgment. And behind them a flame burneth, judgment. And the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. So they're going back into the Garden of Eden. And behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. The desolate wilderness is, a will, is the falling away of the church. Then, verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen. So shall they run. There's your scripture to show that these horses represent the church in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations. You could also use uh, the first chapter of, of Zechariah. Uh, Y'all ought to rehearse what I'm giving you because uh, I'm, I'm telling you the, the most no one will ever understand the Bible or the plan of God if they don't understand the early church fell away. Yes, Brother Boyd. By the prophet Joel. It's in Acts 2.16, Brother Boyd said. I'm going to give you that scripture. Okay, uh, let's see if I can find this right quick. Okay. Here he's seeing a vision, and, and let's start in the 8th verse. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and, and behind him there were red horses, speckled and white, then saith I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with him said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And the angel and they answered and they answered the angel of the Lord and stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro in the earth, through the earth, and behold, all the earth is set as still and is at rest. Anyway, he, he goes into this dream, but I'm just showing you horses here are God. Is, this, this is God's people that went to, to and fro through the earth. And so those are just a couple scriptures to show that horses represent the church. And if you go back to, to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, the white horse, uh, which is in the, the second verse, uh, 6 and 2 Revelation 6 2 the white is the white is the color of righteousness in the Bible so the white horse was the early church the rider was Jesus 
He had a bow in his hand. He went forth conquering and to conquer. That is, conquer over sin. Then the second seal opens up, and, and then there was a red horse. And, and uh, power was given to him that sat on the horse to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. That's, that, that's when sin entered the church. Red is the color of sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, Isaiah said. So you, scarlet you're, is, a, is the color of sin, and uh, or red. That horse is when the church fell away out of the righteousness of the white horse, and the rider changed. That was men that were given a great sword, which is the word of God, and they had power to hurt people. Because they didn't have enough wisdom, the church had fell down and the ministry had enough power to hurt people. It's a, it's a type of a Pentecostal era. And then the next, there went out another horse. Uh, let's see, verse 5. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on them had a pair of balances in his hand. Uh, the... Uh, and, and, he, and he cried, there, there's a, a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley for a penny. Uh, a penny back then was called a denarian, and that was a, actually equal to Roman soldiers' wage for a day. You, you, could, you could only get either a whole day's wages, you could get enough barley to wheat to feed yourself, or you could get uh, three times that much if you've got barley. So, but barley is a lesser, it's a lesser grain than wheat. And so, uh, you know, the, and that's talking about the word of God. By this time, there's a drought, a black horse. Darkness is a picture of ignorance in the Bible, lack of knowledge. And the church, I'm just showing you, the church fell away. It went from righteousness to sin, a sinful sin entered the church. They couldn't keep sin out. Then it went to ignorance, and then finally the pale horse, and death was the rider of the pale horse, and hell followed with it. And that is a uh, religious hell. It's a religious condition. Death was the rider of the horse. The church, the ca that's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was the pale horse, and it could not. It could not give life to its members. It had no anointing from God. Death finally entered into the church, and there wasn't. The church did not have the life of God or anointing of God to be able to produce life in people's souls. And so the church has to be restored down here in the end of this world. We've come through now. What this should help people to see is, is that why all of these different organizations in religion, in Christendom, exist, and why there's so much confusion, and why this group teaches one thing, this group over here teaches something else, this group over here teaches something else. But the body of Christ in the, that's mentioned uh, in the fourth chapter of Ephesians there's just one body. You know, I would, I would take people from here to Ephesians 4 and show them that they need to understand that our vision, that what happened, you know, I always include the, 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 uh, the testimony of Brother William Souders when I talk to people about the falling away of the church to show them that God called Brother Souders to begin to restore the church among uh, in, in the Pentecostal era he started the reformation with Martin Luther you know Martin Luther started the reformation pulled out of the Catholic church he had death warrant was on him they wanted to kill him but he had a great anointing. His message was the just shall live by faith. And he was against, you know, going to the, you know, confession 
and saying your Hail Marys and your Our Fathers and thinking that, that, that those rituals were going to save you, but it took faith. And, and then John and Charles Wesley began to show there was sanctification that uh, you needed to come out from among the world and be separate and live a righteous life. Just having faith alone wouldn't save you. It's going to take living a right, in, in righteousness. And, uh, and anyway, all of these groups, all these different organizations down through the church ages of, Res of Reformation uh, has God reformed a little at a time. Because God couldn't just take us from, you know, from a death to life over in one page. I mean, God's had to work with men down through the times of Reformation, the Protestant movement. Everybody in here know what, wh why it's called the Protestant movement? Because it was protesting against the Catholic Church. That's why it's called Protestant movement. So uh, we're, you know, I've told you that story. When I went in the hospital at, in Springfield in the Catholic Church, I mean Catholic hospital, that girl was asking me, she said, what's your faith? And I said, I looked all around. I said, Protestant. She said, what? I said, Protestant. She said, okay. I said, do you know why it's called Protestant? She said, no. I said, because we're protesters against the Catholic Church. She said, oh, my God. <laughs> I, got, I got a big kick out of doing that to her. Anyway, so uh, in Ephesus, <clears throat> Paul says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, first verse, Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is. Now he's talking to a church two thousand years ago. So we're 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 looking at what they had back there. There is one body and one spirit even as you called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So if Paul's telling them back there there's one body, where's that one body today? You need to ask people. Do you believe that all of these different organizations which, by the way, there's no government that's in those organizations in the Bible like that. There is no place in the Bible that has a government like these churches and Christians them out here. And they can't be one body. They're not, even, they're not even connected to each other. I mean, the Methodist church is not connected to the Assemblies of God church. The, the Episcopalian church is not connected to the Nazarenes. They have nothing to do with each other. They don't believe the same thing. There's a lot of confusion going on. Then I think you could end this up in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations. I'll give you that real quick. I'm giving you a bonus here because we're going over just a little bit. Just a couple minutes. In the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations, and this, this here... You know, it should affect people. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. That word lightened means illuminated. It was given understanding. The earth was given understanding. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. All nations have drunk of the wine of the, wrath, of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are whacked 
rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice saying, Come out of her, our voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. That's about as far as I'd read, and I'd say, Now, do you want to know who this woman is? Turn back to the 17th chapter. Come out of her, my people. It's God's people that he's calling out of something called Babylon. The 17th chapter starts off with the Lord giving a greater detail. And he starts off in the first verse and said, There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. And I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the king of the earth have committed fornications, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. That fornication, by the way, means spiritual fornication. It means having intimacy with someone else besides Christ spiritually. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set up on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet in color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Uh, notice this woman is the mother of harlots. She's got daughters. The Catholic Church is the mother. But when they all join back up with the Catholic Church, which the Bible tells us is going to happen, all of these organizations, which are her daughters, they're products of her. They've held on to the Catholic doctrine all the way through. The only thing the Lutheranism didn't change on was you got to have faith. They, had, they got a little bit more than she got, but they held all of her doctrine outside of that. John and Charles Wesley held on to sanctification, but they held on to the other doctrine. They still believe in the Trinity. They still believe in the hell. They believe you're going to pop and fry and crack and be alive and very aware of what's happening to you, screaming and hollering throughout eternity. <laughs> That's what they teach. You know, I taught that. Back there, when I was—I thought what I heard when I was in Babylon. When I was just a young Christian, but you know, thank God I got more truth today. But this mother is a harlot because she is; she has given herself to falsehood spiritually. She's a, she's a fornicator against Christ spiritually, and she's made her daughters to drink of the wine of her fornication. You don't have to tell them a whole lot more. If they don't see this, then you, you can just close the book and tell them, see you down the road. You know. I asked Brother Clyde Patton one time, I said, Brother Patton, how do you help people new? He said, well, Brother Smith, I throw out a little corn. And if they don't eat it, I put my corn back in my sack. I don't let, you know, he said, I don't let swine. I don't pour my my." corn out for swine to eat. He said, if they don't eat it, they're not hungry for the things of God. So you have to discern whether or not somebody's hungry. But if they are hungry, they'll, they'll eat it. They eat a little of it. They'll say, give me a little more of that. You know, they'll, ask, they'll start asking you questions. Another wise thing to do when you're dealing with new people is this. Don't give them everything you got. All you need to do is start them off with the fact the church fell away. Let them start asking questions about that. 
you got answers in here. You don't have to answer all of that at one time. You could just give them one or two sets, settings of those scriptures. When you're dealing with new people, find out everything you can find out about them, but don't tell them too much about you. You're the one that needs information. They don't. They, they, they need information when they ask for it, but they don't need to know everything you know because you, they can't eat it all at once. You just got to give them a little corn at a time. Let them ask questions. Uh, and I'm, you know, I feel like we need, we need to begin to get minded to begin to win people. Um, I'll say this to you about this church, and uh, you know, I know this is going to go on tape, so I'm going to be a little bit careful, but um, I would like to see people that used to be in this church that are victims or that uh, never create, they weren't problem makers. I would like to see us maybe revisit some of them, see if we can't help them and win them back. I am not interested in helping people back in this church that are devils, that have had way more than one chance. We've dug around the tree way more than a year, and they're devils. And they're troublemakers. They always were troublemakers when they were here, and I don't want them back in this church. I do not want troublemakers back in this church that I absolutely know that they'll hurt this church. I'd be a foolish steward of God to want something like that. Now, anybody, anybody that repents and, and that humbles down and comes back with the right spirit, and some of them that have left here have to repent publicly to, to make it back. I won't tolerate. There's some people that have done enough damage that it will require repentance and true humility to come back here with godly sorrow. But, but anybody's more than welcome back here if they've got the right spirit and they humble down and they want to work right. But if we're going to work iniquity, I don't want them back. In. There's, there's some things, saints. This, this place is not a place for every, every unclean thing to dwell in. This is not what, that's not what this place is all about. And so, you know, but I, you all should know, <laughs> I've bent over, well over backwards for anybody that's ever, ever entered those doors and tried. So, but I do think that, that there are people that are victims that got hurt some way or somebody offended them in some way. They never were troublemakers. They, you know, they just, you know, they just got out, they got shook out, and they never did make their way back. I think some of those people, we should really reach out to them. As long as a person's not doing any damage, then, I, you know, they can be a fixture. You know, they're, <laughs> you know, they can be a fixture in here. It's all right with me as long as they're not causing trouble. I'm, not, I'm, I'm hoping someday God will get a hold of them. But I'm not going to let somebody come in here and start you know, making havoc of the church. Wolves and sheep's clothing is not going to get, I, I'm too smart to know what that is, and I'm not going to tolerate that. But, uh, and I believe these men, you know, have got that, that discernment, you know, and so we're, we're here to protect the people and protect the church and to help it grow and help it flourish. There's nothing that is more exciting than a ch to any church than new people. New people are exciting. New people really get a hold of God. And let me just tell you something. You cannot beg people. You can't, you know, if a person's really hungry for God, you know, people that come in here and say, well, this is, you know, I came over there and here's the way I was. Let me tell you something. If you're hungry for God, you don't care what people's doing. God will get a hold of you and you come in those doors and you'll run to the altar if that's what it takes. If you feel enough of God in your life, you can't always but, here's my crutch, here's the other crutch, here's why I can't walk with you people because i got all these problems. You ain't never going to get saved with all that. God, now there's nothing wrong with treating people with charity and loving them and letting them know we care about them. They should feel that when they come into the church. But if you got to beg them to come here, they're not ready to get saved. If you got to beg people 
and, you know, t carry a stretcher out and put them on a stretcher and carry them in, pet their hair and, and rub them every which way and everything and try to make them think that's what, you know, we're going to do to get them saved. They don't want to be saved. They're not hungry for God, and God ain't dealing with them. If he is, he ain't, they're, not, they're not responding to it, you know. So, you know, we've got to be wise enough to realize when we see God's after somebody, that's when we've got to get after them, too. And we can't always see that till you know, we've got to give people a chance and deal with people. I still do believe in being fishers of men. I think you've got to learn how to catch them, you know, and that, there's, there's, there's an art to it. There's wisdom to that. Anyway, I'll give you a little extra time today. <laughs> See you upstairs. God bless your hearts.